Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. We give you thanks and praise for what we are going to be remembering today, the triumphal entry of your Son into Jerusalem. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your plans and purposes from before the creation took a major leap forward when your Son entered the earth and then when he went to Jerusalem on that donkey that day. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would anoint my tongue to declare this word this morning and anoint our ears to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you see in your bulletin, it says here, Matthew 21 and 22 selected passages, plus other verses, as I skip around. We begin with Exodus chapter 12. So it's not on your bulletin. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are, to, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households. A lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor, he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Then we move to Matthew chapter 21. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The day we celebrate as Palm Sunday would be for God's people the, the tenth day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, the month of Nisan. Which is why I read the Exodus 12 passage, so that we can make that connection. In Jesus' day, the Passover lambs were brought into Jerusalem from Bethlehem. They were brought into the temple court through the sheep gate. Makes sense, right? Bringing in the lambs, bringing them through the sheep gate. They were brought in with much celebration and singing. Now we also have to understand that it wasn't a few little sheep or a few little lambs, you know. It was lots of them. There had to have been, I, you know, I can't even envision all these lambs in one place at one time. Because according to historians and scholars, biblical scholars, there probably were like two million people that came to Passover. According to the word of the Lord from Leviticus chapter 23, the Lord said, these are the days that you are to meet with me. Okay, the first one is, he called it the uh, Feast of First Fruits, followed by 
Feast of Weeks. And then the next one is going to be Trumpets, Atonement, um, Shavuot, Feast of Harvest. Anyway, three times a year, the men were supposed to meet with the Lord in Jerusalem. Families could come too, but the men especially were told, come meet me, says the Lord. So they figured that there were about two million people here in Jerusalem. And the way they figure it, you know, when he says here, you know, if a house is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house, uh, they figure one lamb for every ten people. And so you're one lamb for every ten people, which means there be approximately 200,000 lambs being ushered into Jerusalem from Bethlehem. I can envision, Bethlehem was not that far from Jerusalem. I can envision a solid row of lambs you know, from you know, Bethlehem all the way to Jerusalem, you know, kind of like a parade. For a long time, these lambs just kept on coming. I mean, the sheep gate wasn't that wide that you could get you know, 200,000 in at one push. <laughs> it would take a while. And the high priest would be leading the procession, carrying a lamb. So that's, that's what it would look like. So lambs would be coming in uh, through the sheep gate. They're coming in through the sheep gate. Jesus, however, when he came in, he came in from the east gate. He came into the east gate. And as we have learned, Pastor Mark Viltz is really good about this, teaching us this, is that the, the psalms that were being sung as the lambs were being brought into Jerusalem from Bethlehem were Psalms 111 through 118. And one of the verses in Psalm 118 is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Except that this time, Jesus' disciples and the crowds that had gathered to bring Jesus into Jerusalem, they were singing Psalm 118 to him. That's what got people stirred up. Because now... Something is happening that's not familiar to them. And um, there's a shift going on. What was designated for the lambs being brought in was now being sung to Jesus. Of course, we know what John said at the very beginning of his gospel. said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it was appropriate for them to be singing that. But, don't you know, there were some Pharisees who told Jesus to rebuke his disciples. Now this is not in Matthew's Gospel, this is in Luke's Gospel. They were, it says, rebuke your disciples for, you know, listen to what they're singing, rebuke them for singing these praises to you. And he answered them, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So, Jesus has come in to the east gate, and he is being praised. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the lambs, 200,000 or so lambs, are coming in at the same time. Those lambs, as we read here in Exodus chapter 12, they had to be unblemished. So, they had to pass the test. They could not have any blemishes on them. But what happens when Jesus enters into Jerusalem and enters into the east gate of the temple, what he does then is he immediately begins to work, going about cleansing the temple. Verse 12 here of Matthew 21 says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. You know, that Jesus cleansed the temple is exactly what needed to be done. It was being misused. The area where the money changers were and where they were buying and you know, where they were selling animals for sacrifice, 
that was given to the nations for prayer so that the nations could draw near to the Lord. God didn't say, Israel, you're mine, and I don't love anybody else. No. God, through Israel, was wanting to bless the nations. I mean, back in Genesis chapter 12, we hear when God comes to Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you. You are going to become a great nation. And in the end of that, he says, and all people will be blessed through you. And of course, we go jumping over to Jesus, and of course, Jesus being a descendant of Abraham, he does bless all nations. But the entire people, the entire descendants of Abraham were to be a blessing to the nations. Why? Because they could point to the one true God. So the cleansing needed to take place so that the temple could be returned to what it was supposed to be. It was being used inappropriately. But what Jesus did by, be, you know, by cleansing the temple started a series of questions, a series of tests, which would be raised by the religious leaders. If you want to know the title of this particular sermon, they don't normally have titles, but this has a title. Jesus passes his exams. See, though the religious leaders did not fully understand what they were doing, they were actually examining Jesus for blemishes. He had to be examined. He had to pass the test. He had to pass his exams for only an unblemished lamb. Only an unblemished lamb was worthy to be brought to the Passover table. So now let's look at the questions that Jesus was asked. After spending the night in Bethany, this is now verse 23, he entered the temple, and the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. So now the testee becomes the tester. They didn't expect that. The baptism of John, asked Jesus, was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? And if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. He also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority do I do these things. Now this is chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And on hearing this, they were amazed. And leaving him, they went away. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking Asking, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died and having no children, left his wife to his brother, so also the second and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? Now, here are those that say there is no resurrection, so they're like going, so now in the resurrection. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? 
for they all had married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. Oh, don't you just love being... I'm sure they loved hearing that. <laughs> Everybody likes being told, You're wrong. <laughs> At least it's kindly done here. You are mistaken. Not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Notice that it's like angels, not angels. Okay, everybody got that? There are a lot of people who think you die, you become an angel. No. Angels are a separate creature from people. Okay, so. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. You know, one of the things that we've got to get used to, and apparently the Sadducees hadn't done this, is every word of scripture is important. Every word, every nuance, every everything is important. And clearly, you know, when God was talking to Moses, and the Sadducees were big on the five books of Moses. Okay? So already in, in Exodus, at the burning bush, Moses is asking, you know, God who he is, and God says, I am who I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am. Am. It's a present tense verb. Which, of course, means that as a present tense verb, it not only had um, practical results then, but it has lasting results that keep carrying on and carrying on and carrying on and carrying on forever. Present tense. I am. Well, he's not the God of the dead. If he was the, you know, if he, if he was God of the dead, he, he would say, I was. Or maybe later, I will be. But he says, no, I am. It's a present tense reality that I am the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. You know, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I mean, even before Christ, God was the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Sadducees had it wrong. Why? Because they had not rightly divided the word of God. Probably what had happened is they, somebody came up with the bright idea that, you know, the dead are dead. You know, nothing's going to happen to them. You know, they're gone. And instead of going back to the word, rightly dividing the word, they just went with the theory. No. The Bible is God's word. It is true. It always will be true. And so we have to, it is our source, so we always have to go back to it and see, what does God say? Because people will come up with all kinds of weird stuff. Verse 34. Not to be undone. I added that, so it's not in the text. Not to be undone, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. They're having a confab to see if they can trip up Jesus. One of them, a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, they had lawyers back there. Back there, back then. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. Oh, uh uh-oh, that's always a problem. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, the son of David. And he said to them, how, then how does David in the spirit, this is not natural knowledge, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. That's the question. How does David do that? How can the Christ be David's son and yet David call him Lord? Verse 46, nobody was able to answer him a word. Nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him any other question. Say, well, if we ask something, he's going to have an answer. If we ask too much, Guess what? He's going to start asking us questions. And if we start asking him the way we'd like to answer, if we start answering him the way we want to answer them, we'll get ourselves in a lot of trouble with the people. But Jesus had passed the test. Unblemished. No fault found. And because no fault was found with him, he was now ready to go to the cross unblemished. The authorities, the religious authorities had authorized him with their questions to go to the cross. They didn't know they were doing that. But a lot of times we get to be unwitting participants in what God is doing because God is able. But isn't it interesting that Jesus passed all of their exams, but they didn't pass any of his. Isn't that interesting? But it's just really cool, you know, to look at those particular passages and and see what he went through and know he was going through those things to qualify him. Not that he needed man's qualifications, okay? But to qualify him to go to the cross so that now we can look back at the word, and go, he passed the test. There's no fault in him, no blemishes. He can go to the cross. Because had there been one blemish in him, he would not have qualified. Because it had to be, every sacrifice had to be an unblemished animal. Had to be. Jesus had no blemishes. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This week, Thursday and Friday, we will remember again, you know, how Jesus, we do it every week, how Jesus transformed the Passover meal into the blood of the new covenant, the new covenant, and transformed that bread. You know, now it is in his body. It's his blood. And Friday will remember his death. But we already know how that ends. Three days later, which if you go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it doesn't work in our calendar. Okay, so don't go there. Three days later. Three days and three nights later, according to the word of God, he rises from the dead. But just because I told you now the end of the story, which of course you already knew, doesn't mean don't come back. Amen.